let's go to Psalm 107. I want to talk to you about something called sayaking in the Hebrew. A Hebrew scholar told me this. And so I want to, S-Y-A-C-H-I-N-G, sayaking in the Hebrew. It means to complain before the Lord, not before man. To groan. To bring forth your petition with heartfelt groanings and complaints. God, can you do this? God, will you do this? God, are you going to do it for me? Complaining and praying and crying out to the Lord when there is no hope. There's no hope. Let's just say you've got a situation in front of you. There is no hope for you. Some of us have that. No hope for us. And so you sayak before the Lord. You complain, you groan, you pray, you cry out. And you say to the Lord, can you supply a table for me in the desert? My life is a desert right now. Or let's say just this one area is a desert. Or maybe there's several areas. I'm in a desert wasteland in my life. And I'm crying out to you, God, and saying, I'm sighing. I'm sighing and aching before the Lord. Sighing and aching before the Lord brings forth great fruit. You know, we've gotten this concept that we can't complain to the Lord. God doesn't want us to complain to each other. Do you know why? Because when we complain to one another, we pollute the other person with our doubt and unbelief. But when we sigh or we sigh and complain in anguish before the Lord, he's the one who can help us. We call upon his hand when we sigh, when we sigh and groan and complain and ache before the Lord for that which we do not have, but that which we see in our spirit. Sayaking is complaining before the Lord. God, I don't have enough. I don't have enough of you. I don't have my dreams. I don't have my heart's desires. Here's what I want in life, and I don't have it. Now, what's wrong is when we go complain to somebody else because they can't give it to you. The arm of flesh is weak. The only one who can give us our dreams and our hopes and our longings is God. So that's why we get to complain before him. He doesn't want you to muzzle your mouth. Here's what we've done. Here's how we've been taught in Christendom, in the church. You just shut up. You muzzle your mouth. You put a tape over it. If you ever want to complain, don't you complain to the Almighty. That's bad to complain to the Almighty. No, it's not. That's who you're supposed to complain to. That's who you're supposed to sigh and ache to all the time until you get what you want before the throne of grace. He wants to give you everything he's got at the throne. He wants to pour and pour and pour it out on you. But he has to hear your heart longings. He has to hear your cries. He has to hear your complaining to him because he's the one who can do something about it. Our complaints to him move the hand of God. The hand of God is the Holy Spirit. And as we complain and sigh and sigh and ache and go before him saying, this is what I have to have from you. I'm not looking to another. I'm only looking to you. I've got to have it to the depth and core of my being. There are things inside of me that are not satisfied. Can't we say that, every single one of us? I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied. You've given me so much, and I appreciate your goodness, but I am not yet satisfied. Stay in that place where you aren't fat and sassy and satisfied, saying, well, I've got all I want. Don't be satiated. Satiated means you're full, you're filled to the full, and you can't receive anymore. Always come to the Lord on empty, saying, I'm not satisfied. I have not been satiated. You promised that you would satiate the lives of the priest with goodness. I have to have more of your goodness. I don't have enough goodness. Here's where you've got to fill in some goodness because I don't have it. You then enumerate to him the goodness that you have to have from him. I don't know what the goodness is that you have to have from him. 
I know what the goodness I have to have for him. I have got to have intimacy with Jesus Christ. I've got to have intimacy with God the Father and the Holy Ghost. I've got to have intimacy with his angels and especially in his word. What are your needs? What are your great demands? What are your great needs from him that only he can satisfy? You must bring them up from the service, surface and look at them and understand what it is that you have to have from him to be satisfied with your life. God will give it to you. I want to look at Psalm 107. It's such a remarkable psalm. This is the psalm God gave me when I was living in Tulsa, Oklahoma. My mother and I were living with my sister. She lived in a beautiful, beautiful home on a 16-acre pond, had black swans and white swans. The geese were always there on the water. I worked for Kenneth E. Hagen as his editor. My sister worked for Oral Roberts. And we would come home in the evening and we'd get in our rafts. We had rafts and we'd go out in the middle of the pond and we'd look at the black swans. They're so remarkable. And the white swans and their little babies. And we'd look at the geese in the water, frolicking in the water. It was idyllic. It was so yummy spiritually. And I'd take manuscripts of books that I was working on for Brother Hagen and I'd go out and I'd edit these manuscripts and I just lay in the sunshine. It was the best life I could have ever thought possible. There wasn't anything lacking, seemingly. I had great fellowship with the Lord. I had a prayer partner that we'd start Saturday, every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock in the morning, and we would worship God in my apartment till 3 o'clock in the night, worship all those hours, would meet, wouldn't take breaks because we were so caught up in ecstasy that we didn't need anything else. We just needed Jesus. Came into a place in the Lord that was so phenomenal that for days I couldn't speak. I couldn't utter a word because I was so caught up in the Spirit of God. I was so fulfilled with that kind of worship life. It was so meaningful to me. And I got so close to Jesus that I could reach out and touch him. He was mine in a way that I've never experienced him before. And God the Father has always been mine. He's my special companion. When I was a little girl and I would run to my grandmother's house, somehow, I don't know how, by the grace of God, I would look up and see my heavenly Father. And he was watching me and looking at me. And he loved me and adored me. And there was a special bond with him. And it's been all my life with God the Father. So now fast forward. I'm in this idyllic life, living with my sister and my mother in my sister's house in that, on that beautiful pond, Mill Creek Pond. And I walk into my bedroom one day, and the Lord says, don't get too comfortable here because you've got to go to Oregon, and you've got to start a church for me. I mean, it was a dagger that was stuck into my heart. How could you do this to me? How could you kill me like this? Why would you kill all my desires by telling me to go back to that blankety-blank place? How could you do this to me? You're killing me. Don't you know it? Well, that was the point, to kill me. This is the point sometimes with God. He has to kill us so he can make us greater because we have a ceiling on all that we desire. And it's not that great. It's not that tall. It's not that big. So he's got to kill who we are, our personal height that we think is so, oh, so grand, oh, so high. And it's really not. He wants to get us up to the height and the breadth and the depth and the width of all that is in Christ. So he killed me that day. And he sent me. Well, I cried for four years. That ought to tell you something. And so in, in family prayer at Rama, where I worked as an editor, every Tuesday and Thursday we would have prayer, and I'd be down on my knees, and I would sob and sob and sob for the full hour, hour and a half. All I did was cry. And Pastor Hagen would walk by, and I could feel him and sense him stop and look at this woman who's sobbing her heart out. And then he'd make another turn in the room and stop and look at this woman who's just acting the fool, crying her heart out. And he probably thought, you poor thing, what is your story? But I was crying tears that were watering the seed of greatness that God had put in me. 
that I didn't even know were that were there. You've got seeds of greatness in you that you don't even know are there. You've got to water them. And sometimes we water them with our tears and our anguish and our groanings and our longings. They've got to be watered. Think about it. Any tree cannot grow unless it's watered with tears. It's got to be watered with water. Your tears, my tears, are supernatural. They're supernatural. They will go into your being, and they will grow those seeds. They will water those seeds. So those seeds can do exactly what Mark 4 says. They will sprout and grow and increase in us. We know not how. We can't see that our longings and our crying before God and our sigh aching, sighing and aching, our sigh aching, complaining, I don't have enough. I've got to have more. I've got to have more of you. I've got to have more of life. I've ha got to have greater life within me. I've got to have a greater relationship with you. Whatever it is that you're longing for, you've got to have it, and you cannot do without it. And you best not shut your mouth and say, I just have to be satisfied with where I'm at. Oh, no. That's what the devil will tell you. Just shut up. Stop complaining. The Almighty doesn't want to hear your complaint. Nothing is further from the truth. The Almighty has to hear your complaints. He has to hear your sighing and aching before him. He has to hear your yearnings before him so that he can start using those prayers. Pela, it's a gap that has to be joined together. You've got a gap between you. This is a Hebrew word, Pela, it's prayer. You've got a gap between you and that thing that you desire. And you're going to fill that gap so that your desire will come and be one with you by your prayers and your longings and your crying out to God and sighing before him and aching before him and longing before him for that thing that you so desire. And if you don't do it, nobody's going to do it for you. So you best not close your mouth. You best not close your heart. Because this kind of crying and carrying on before the Lord has to happen so the seeds within you can sprout and grow and increase. You know not how. And in Mark 4, just turn there very quickly. God is the author of this sayaking. He institutes it. He, he puts it within you to do it. And you can't close your mouth. Verse 30, and Jesus said, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what parable shall we picture it? This is a word picture. Word pictures are phenomenal. They tell us truth. It is like a mustard seed, which, when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on earth. Everybody has faith and seeds of longing the size of a mustard seed within them. Whether you know it, whether you feel it or not, they're in there. Then Jesus said, but when it is sown, when it is sown in your heart, in your life, in your innermost being, it grows up, if you water it, with sigh, aching, sighing and aching, asking, prayer, crying out. Crying out is sigh aching too. Crying out to the Almighty. It will grow up and become greater than all the herbs, than all the seeds, than all the trees. And it will become so large that it will shoot out large branches. This is within you. Where's the tree at in you? Some of you want your heart's desire and you've got seeds, but you've never watered them. With groanings, Romans 8, 26, groanings before the Lord. You can groan inwardly. Nobody has to hear you. You can groan outwardly, but you've got to groan. You've got to carry on before the Lord. You've got to complain and sigh and ache before him for that thing that you want in life. And when you do that, you'll be watering that seed. And it will sprout and grow and increase within you, you know not how, until it's a tall tree. Now, once it's a tree within you, you can feast off of it because now you have your petition. And now you will partake of the fruit of that tree that you and the Almighty have grown up together. Do you see that? Your own prayers, the watering, the washing of the water of the word, using scripture, 
to harvest the seed within you. Lord Jesus, you said it, now you have to do it. You spoke it with your mouth, 1 Kings 8, 15 and 24. You spoke it with your mouth, now fulfill it with your hand. This is the way you have to carry on before God. And then it will sprout and grow and increase and become a huge tree. And the fruit that grows on that tree will be supernatural fruit, and you'll eat of it all the time. Remember, if you don't grow up those seeds, who's going to do it? Who is going to do it? It's for you and Jesus in partnership. Now I want you to go back to Psalm 107. I give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Whatever you do, stay on God's side. When you go through a trial, don't ever blame God. Don't ever chastise God for the trial. The trial is there because we live in a fallen world and because there's a devil. But God will take every trial you and I encounter in life to make us greater on the inside. Because we will go through that trial and God will bring his help, his mighty hand, and we'll overcome it. And once we're on the other side of the trial, it's experience. Experience is a Hebrew word which means get out of the trial what you were supposed to get going through the trial. Within every trial, it's not that Satan's teaching us, it's that God is teaching us. In every trial, you have to gain experience. And experience means that you've got to find out, okay, what did I learn go through, going through this trial? What did I get out of it in Christ? How did I change? How did I become greater? How did I get stronger? It's not that God throws trials at us. There are already trials in the earth. Just living here is a big trial. But God has got something to teach us in every single trial where when we're the other side of the trial, now we've got experience and we need to say, okay, I learned that lesson well. I learned my lesson. For me, when God told me to move out here, I don't know if I want to confess this. Sheesh. He showed me a man out here that I had dated in college. And he told me that that man would be my husband. Well, I didn't want to move to Portland. He was wonderful. I loved him. But I threw such a fit. I remember one day I walked into the, the cafeteria at Kenneth Hagin Ministries, and I said to the Lord, no, I won't go. I'm telling you something. If you've got any brains, don't tell God no you will go to hell. I don't mean literally. You will start going through hell at the moment you tell God no. So I got in God's face. Big shot me, little pipsqueak. I had the audacity to get in God's face and say, no, I'm not going. Did I think I could win against the Almighty? Did I know the horrors my life was going to go into? No. Wisdom is gained by costly experience. So I said no to the Almighty, thinking I'm a big shot. From then on, my life went into hell. And finally, I had to go anyway because God's foot was on my tush, my banooch, my derriere. And he shoved me out of that place. I went to camp meeting that year. And my mother is sitting across from me in the grandstands in the arena, this huge arena that held 18,000 people. And Kenneth E. Hagen, the greatest prophet of our time spoke and said, there's someone here. As Soon as he said, there's someone here, my heart starts. I thought it was gonna beat out of my heart. It was the Holy Ghost bearing witness to me that he was talking to me. Brother Hagen prophesied and said, there's somebody here. God has asked you to do something. It's oh so far greater. It's so great. You couldn't do anything as great as what God has told you to, called you to do. But if you say no, if you won't go, there will be repercussions. And then the Holy Ghost rivets my eyes on my darling, beautiful mother sitting across from me in the arena. I'm in the employee section. She's right across from me. The Holy Ghost rivets my eyes on my beautiful mother, whom I adored, and said, the Holy Ghost said to me, her life will be shortened because of your disobedience. Because of your disobedience, you'll open the door to the devil. 
It's always true. Our disobedience always opens the door to the devil. Ephesians 4, 27. If you won't go, the Spirit of God said through Brother Hagen, if you say no to God and won't go, it will cost you more than you ever want to pay. And I knew within myself that my mother would die. I knew that I would open a door to the devil and she would die. You think God's foot wasn't on my tush to push me out of that place and to push me to Portland, awful Oregon? I had no choice when I heard that. So I left. Took me four years of crying. Took me rebellion. So then when I got to Oregon, I saw the man that I had dated in college. I, I, we worked at the same place together. And we had a, uh, a relationship, a, a wonderful relationship. Then I quit that job and went back full time to school, and so I lost contact with him. His name was Larry. And so I saw him when I came back to Portland, or before I'm coming to Portland. He called me out of the blue, and he wanted to see me. So I was coming home to Portland anyway, and we, we saw each other. The sparks were still there. Everything was intact. The relationship was just right there just to go on. Then after that is when I told God no. And finally, when we moved, when we did move, finally, God's foot pushing me out. We got a townhouse in Vancouver. I'd ask God to be, give me, put me by the water. I'm thinking Lake Oswego. God put me on the water. I want to be on the water like Lake Oswego. Well, he instead put me in Vancouver, and our townhouse was over the swimming pool. He's got a sense of humor. He fulfilled my desire, but it was littler. <laughs> and so one day, my uncle called. Now, my uncle, my uncle Eddie, Epi, his wife knew Larry. They, they just knew each other through events. One day, my Uncle Epi called, and they were talking, and my mother came to me. Now, remember, I had drugged my feet about going. I had said no. I had already seen Larry come back to town and seen him, and our relationship was still there with all the sparks. Then I went back home, and I said no. Finally, I hear the word of prophecy at camp meeting that year, and God says, it's a far, far better thing you do than you've ever known. And if you don't do it, there will be repercussions. You will pay a price that you would never want to pray. And inside, the Holy Ghost said, you'll open a door to the devil, and your mother's life will be shortened. So then I went. So it was, there was a time elapse, and I went. She came to me, and she said, I must tell you something. And I said, what? And she said, Larry is dead. Oh, my gosh, the sword that went through my heart. And I said, Dad, don't say that awful thing to me. You can't say something that terrible to me. Why would you say that? And she said, your uncle just told me that. One day, he had a black spot on his foot, and he had a black line going up his legs. He was a jogger. He was so in shape. He was slender. He was young and vital. And he went to the doctor. And the doctor looked at the bottom of his foot and saw this black set spot and said, oh, my God, it was a melanoma. And Larry fought it, but he was just enough out of God's perfect will. I was just enough out of God's, because I was in rebellion at that time. I hadn't acquiesced with hearing the word at camp meeting. That hadn't happened yet. So Larry was just enough out of God's will and I was really in rebellion. And he fought it and fought it, and he died. I tell you what, saying no to God will cost you something so dear, you never want to pay that price. You never want to pay that price. That's why you sigh before God. You ache. You complain. You bring your complaint. Okay, I want to read through this just a bit, okay, so you understand why I'm going here. Give thanks to the Lord for he's good. God's always good. He's never the culprit. He's never the big meanie. That's the devil. Get your theology straight. The thief cometh but to kill, steal, and destroy, but God comes to give us life and that more abundantly. 
that the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. He's gathering us from our dismal places, our places of abandonment and bitterness. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. Many of us have wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in, hunger and thirsty. They're so fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of all their distresses. This is sighing. This is sighing and aching and complaining and bringing all of our bitterness. I am so bitter at my life, or I'm so bitter at this circumstance, I'm so bitter at that circumstance. You are the one with the great big mighty hand that can heal me and take pluck this out of my heart. You've got to do it because I'm sayaking before you and I'm bringing before you all my complaints, all my dismal, futile attempts to make of myself something. I'm bringing them to you. Now you've got to build me and make me what you'd have me be. Do you see this? They cried out to the Lord in their trouble. Don't think you can't cry out to the Lord and complain to the Lord. You best complain to the Lord. Just don't complain to your brothers and sisters because they don't have the supply. God alone has the supply. 